Hey, welcome to Scoobytopia. Why, Billy, your pants right off your butt? Uh-oh, no joke. Right off your rack. Last time we looked at the iconic made-for-TV trilogy of Scooby-Doo films from the 80s, but did you know about the most recent sort of trilogy? Released February 5th, 2019, Scooby-Doo and the Curse of the 13th Ghost was the 29th direct-to-video film in the series, a supposed series finale to the unfinished 80s 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo series, followed by supposed sequel Scooby-Doo Return to Zombie Island on October 1st, 2019, both in time for Scooby-Doo's 50th anniversary. And lastly, Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo, a year later than expected, October 6th, 2020. In contrast to the love usually shown to that other trilogy, however, you usually see people bring at least the first two up with nothing but disdain and utter hatred. Try googling them and you'll see they might just be two of the most hated Scooby-Doo movies ever made. But are they really deserving of it? Or are they misunderstood? And what studio meddling led them to become what they are? We're going to get into all of that finally. One thing to understand about these movies is that they kind of weren't written to be a trilogy entirely, and the ones trying to be sequels aren't really trying to be sequels. By way of Warner Studio mandate, I know it's confusing. Return to Zombie Island was a mandate from the studio entirely, in fact. A movie that really did not want to be a sequel, but more so play in that setting. None of the films would really be marketed as a trilogy either, and even one of the writers was unaware they were making a connected movie until later. We'll get into that. 13th Ghost and Return, as I'll call them for short, were also mandated to not have any supernatural elements. As we'll find out, a producer hated when Scooby has them so the films had to carefully step around that. It's a common misconception that they retcon supernatural events of what they follow up entirely, but that isn't technically true, but we'll get into that as well. It's admittedly confusing and convoluted, so it makes sense that it's hard to follow and just assume. The thing is, people hate these first two movies because they're sort of billed as sequels. If these weren't, I actually don't think they would be considered the worst Scooby outings ever. They have really fun characterizations and events and ideas in them. If 13th Ghost was just a movie calling back to the series with more Vincent, I think people would have a lot more fun than if they expect it to be the end-all be-all series finale to the show. As is, it's sort of using the setting of the unfinished TV series as an excuse for Daphne to be a badass girl boss she really wasn't in the material. It's just the closest era to that and how the writers saw her in the show as a kid growing up. I love me some Daphne girl boss, it's just highly debatable. And the idea of returning to an iconic location or story, of which they also reference Reluctant Werewolf as said in the previous video, and doing a mockumentary kind of thing actually sounds like a lot of fun. Return just unfortunately was billed and promised basically to be a direct Zombie Island sequel when it never wanted to be. When I watched it without that sequel idea in mind, I didn't actually hate it. It just doesn't treat the original Zombie Island movie as sacred territory like Scooby fans do. And that bugs people. I get it, I'm not gonna ask you to like these movies if you hate them. I just wanna get into what they really seem to want to be. I have plenty of negatives. 13th Ghost is probably the worst off and most frustrating with the loose continuity that actually makes me a little angry. But that isn't to say there's nothing good here, and it's really interesting to look into how they got to be what they are in the end. With that said, let's really explore how much a studio can meddle with a movie or two until the target audience doesn't even want it anymore. You might even say, these movies might have gotten away with it if it weren't for that meddling studio. So, let's start off with the 13th Ghost movie, the one I personally like the least. Not that I hate it, because I still like it a lot. But boy, does this one make me mad as a Scooby continuity enthusiast. Anyway, the movie was written by Tim Sheridan, writer of Scooby-Doo and the Gourmet Ghost before it, who, as a lifetime Scooby fan himself, is probably as well aware of 13 Ghost continuity as any fan of it. He even rewatched the show to prepare, along with the rest of the crew. Like with Return, people at the studio, Jim Krieg and Jay Bastian specifically, came to him directly with the idea for the movie as a sort of finale already, and hired him to write what they wanted. After all, as he pointed out to them, the gang never caught the 13th Ghost in the original show. It wasn't his choice for the movie to not end up having a single real supernatural element. This instead was a mandate from Krieg before he was ever hired. Out of respect for the series and fans, he did try to make it ambiguous, but it's confusing. I'll explain how he did it when we get there. I promise I will try and break this one down. Back to Jim Krieg, as I said, he hates when supernatural elements or real monsters are in Scooby-Doo, which means so long as he has a say, it's not likely happening. Kind of senseless to touch areas that are specifically like that then, no? It was basically decided that Scooby-Doo could only be what that vision of the franchise is, no exceptions, which kind of kills any creativity, even if I get it. Krieg and Warner just want classic Scooby. I think his meddling was far worse in return though, so we'll really get into it there. Anyway, they were mandated that this was more so a sequel to Where Are You than The 13 Ghosts in terms of continuity and timeline, explaining why Flim Flam is now a teen somehow when he was a kid in the series, yet the gang is also stated to be 17 going on 18, and Zombie Island was also somehow considered to be in that same timeline due to the following movie obviously, which also doesn't make sense because they are clearly adults there, so a uh, weird mandate. As for Scrappy, they considered it, but Warner really didn't want him in the movie, and Sheridan felt he couldn't get it to work so he didn't fight for him this time. He did say he wanted a scrappy renaissance, like many of us though. Despite him trying to get them a visual cameo that was cut, I doubt the other characters like a certain ghost duo, if you know you know, were ever considered by the studio however given the nature of them being, well, real ghosts. You get the idea by now, right? Warner decided that they wanted to do a 13 ghost thing, maybe a finale, but not really the way fans wanted. Zero allowance for the supernatural, so Sheridan basically just had to have fun with the characters and setting as best he could in those parameters. And it became one of the most disliked Scooby movies as a consequence, so it it is what it is. I said I would break it down though, so let's do that. Let's try and make some sense of this weird little movie. 
Starting off the trilogy, the film sets up the plot with the 13th ghost, Asmodeus, attacking a younger Vincent Van Gogh, pre-13 ghosts, along with his friend Mortifer. They trap him and finally catch all the ghosts, but there are minions, and when Vincent won't let him take the chest to keep him safe, Mortifer sacrifices himself and is killed while Vincent tearfully escapes. Vincent, now voiced by Maurice LaMarche in place of the late Vincent Price like in Mystery Incorporated, recaps the 13 ghost story with a spellbound prologue, which Tim Sheridan did on his own and was encouraged to expand so it could be the opening credit sequence, which does work really nicely. Once upon a demon chest, where evil spirits manifest, the best of friends began a quest and set out like a thing possessed. Seriously, despite saying they couldn't find a way to work Scrappy into the movie's current timeline, they don't even bother to show him in the silhouettes despite young Flim Flam's presence. The visual nods to the series and ghosts are great, but not even showing Scrappy here is just kind of annoying. We cut to the gang solving a mystery but getting it wrong. Why was he running? I'm afraid of teenagers. <gasps> Hold the phone. The sheriff calls them criminally negligent, pointing out they're almost 18 and could see prison time if someone pressed criminal charges. He warns them he'll put them away if he sees them driving around in the mystery machine one more time. This is their only warning to give up mystery solving. And so, Fred sells the van while they get rid of all their artifacts, to Scooby and Shaggy's delight. Thelma points out they've solved all their cases anyway when a shopper finds a crystal ball that Daphne, Scooby, and Shaggy immediately recognize. To Fred and Velma's confusion, Vincent asks for their help, so they have to explain to the two of them what happened the summer they were at camp, as we're putting it. If they're 17 going on 18 now, how old were they in 13 Ghosts doing all that? Not to mention the series also went into the winter, not just summer. And if Zombie Island is canon to the trilogy and they're at least 20 at the youngest there, but still 17 here, how does that... Uh, yeah. Fred does point out they should have expected it would come up again if they never caught the last ghost. And Daphne finally finds her iconic costume and even does this amazing hair transformation. One of the best scenes, we can all agree. Ate and devoured. Turns out she even still has the old van from 13 Ghosts too, making Fred a little jealous after losing his own now. Thelma reads the tome on the way, which says things like the chest can only be opened by the living, which seems obvious to her, just making her annoyed beyond belief, because she doesn't believe. There's no way ghosts or anything in this book are real. After some phantom road rage, they make it to Vincent's, and Fred becomes further insecure when Daphne takes charge instead, which, again, she really didn't do in the original series. The writer admitted this and explained it was just how he saw her watching the series growing up, which I can appreciate at least. If nothing else, it saves us from another plot of Daphne not knowing what her place is in the gang and instead giving it to Fred. We do bring up Flam Flam for a moment, and Daphne sends Velma to watch the boys while she realizes the crystal ball could lead them to Vincent. Thelma happily reveals the creepy shutters are on a pulley system and aren't haunted, and gets even more excited to prove the howling wind comes from speakers. He'll lead us to the source of the- Like, I don't need it. Fred's explain to me, Velma. I'm in. The gang were formed by chance and find Vincent tied up in a coffin, and Asmodeus appears wanting the chest of demons. But it turns out Shaggy sent it to Vincent and to the wrong place, and now it seems to be lost. Vincent catches everyone up on how the chest was found, and of course eventually opened by the boys. But Velma really does not believe the 12 they caught were real. Shaggy notices the painting on the wall doesn't look much like Vincent. But he points out they need to get back to the Himalayas and get the chest first, so they head off. Yet again, the future liberals want. But can you be surprised Vincent would hire Scooby? Vincent Price was bisexual in real life. Obviously, he's down with the crew. Speaking of crew, Fred is more dismayed to see Shaggy is piloting the aircraft. <clears throat> uh, stewardess? That's flight attendant. Whatever you say, toots. Vincent admits the fake things Velma found were his security system as she further celebrates ghosts not being real, but he promises her she'll soon change her mind. They finally arrive, though Daphne notices a courtyard she doesn't remember. My air boo and boo host just scream mailed me back on my diphone. The package from Shaggy was never delivered by the ghostal service. Calm down, Monster High. Anyway, nobody's around because of the demon, except it seems the guy shopping earlier. Daphne then sends Velma and Fred off to see if Shaggy's package with the chest is still at the post office, while she and the others follow the guy. Though as the duo search between some cheers, they're being watched. The others lose the guy but spot the ghost car again which starts an avalanche. Fred then gets trapped by a hooded teen, but he lets them check around after an explanation where it seems Shaggy's package was only taken as of this morning. And overhearing, the kid takes them to the chest of demons. Thelma not believing in it opens the chest and both become terrified when something happens, but the kid goes over to reveal it's just a cooler. And they even have all kinds of other merch. Realizing they're ghost hunters, he takes them back further to show them all his special ghost hunting tools to sell them. But Thelma isn't interested and they head off. Fred laments his feeling lost when they both get taken, while the others find themselves trapped in the temple. As Medeus appears with a package that has the chest, and as they get it back, Vincent admits he hasn't been able to cast spells anymore. Convenient for a movie where they can't have supernatural, but tosses his crystal ball and transports the others outside, contacting them with a spare to say goodbye because it's not safe for them now. The other two are dropped back down and Velma is suddenly changed after her first possible real ghost, saying she sees everything, even without her glasses. Funny, since Zombie Island is canon to this movie and that involved real ghosts. Daphne wonders if the sheriff was right, and the changed Velma agrees, everyone seeming down. So 
Fred's leader instincts kick in and he gives them all a pep talk before admitting his summer was actually spent at cheerleading camp. Now he believes his job is believing in and cheering on the others. Recharged, Fred gets the van ready poorly and they return to the guy from before for his supplies. The others pull off their part of the plan to get back into the temple and the guy joins Fred and Velma for their part where they run into the ghost car, which they escape thanks to his help. He then gets them into the temple too while Vincent fights off Asmodeus. The others try to distract with a fake ghost, Vincent losing the chest to protect them, and the gang reunite. More than expected as the three recognize the guy to be Flim Flam from 13 Ghosts. He simply explains how he looks to me because he was overdue for a growth spurt and the writer didn't treat this too serious but it bothers me you know. He was a literal kid even if we're trying to say this took place maybe two or three years ago that still doesn't explain his change especially if the gang were still teens but are now not even 18 yet and I uh, it gives me a headache. Here's what just pisses me off. Warner didn't want him in the movie like Scrappy and the writer just had to hope for the best so I guess we're lucky we got what we did. He asks where Scrappy is and Fred and Velma's response is confusion and asking what a Scrappy is. Be serious. Do not play with me. The two of them met and spent time with Scrappy countless times from his first appearance onward. They know who Scrappy is. It's not even about him not showing up here. It's them suddenly not knowing who he even is when they 100% know who Scrappy is. It just makes me angry. Anyway, okay, that's over. Moving on. They find Vincent who says this is all his fault. Explaining the painting earlier is actually his ancestor, the most powerful sorcerer in the world who was corrupted, stripped of mortality, and trapped in the chest. In other words, he's Asmodeus, and Vincent feels responsible for whatever happens as Medeus opens the chest, and as Velma's about to use the equipment, she points out she read the rule about the chest only being able to be opened by the living. Yet, a demon just opened it. He grabs the chest to escape, but Daphne takes him down, unmasking Vincent's old friend Mortifer. He faked his death and wanted the chest for himself all along, and the shopper guy returns, actually an undercover agent searching for him. Then, like, why did you run away from us? I'm afraid of Daphne and Shaggy also realize the other ghosts aren't loose, wondering where they are, and Scooby looks in the chest to find rotted food. It's actually one of the coolers and Shaggy sent the wrong chest. Being an illusionist, however, Mortifer escapes with his ghost car he controlled, and Daphne points out he's in danger because of the avalanche it causes. Not heeding the warning, he falls through, and Vincent seems to see the spirit of his ancestor at peace. Velma points out a mistranslation. His spirit didn't want revenge, just redemption, and Vincent's safety now allows him to rest. Shaggy tries to say it was just a cloud of snow, but Scooby stops him. Mortifer survived, it seems, but the proper authority finally take him down. Fred and Daphne both compliment each other after a roaring mission together while Velma's skepticism returns. She says she didn't debunk Vincent's ancestor stuff because it's so important to him, and also writes off the first 12 real ghosts as a mass hallucination from oxygen deprivation. She also points out what took them before was a ski lift. What's important to note here is that she's not definitively saying the 12 ghosts were fake and never happened. The others remain skeptical of her assertions. What she's saying is simply what she believes as someone that has to believe it because she can't accept it to be true. Her explanation doesn't actually make sense if you've seen the show since she says it only happened due to being in the Himalayas, but we know it took place all over. We see the movie throw us a bone here where she's about to open the real chest, which turned out to be in the van the whole time, but as the others are terrified, she chooses not to open the chest, and in turn revealing a final verdict. It's kind of a letdown and annoying for 13 Ghost fans, but it's not saying it didn't happen. It just didn't happen again on this particular adventure. Or did it, if you believe that was Vincent's ancestor's spirit? It was never going to be allowed due to Warner and Jim Creek's insistence, so this is about the best we can get in saying it still could have happened. Flim Flam gives them some of his old stuff as a goodbye, and they get back on their flight home. So long, sports fans. Daphne calls off their retirement as her last act as leader, and she and Velma still aren't convinced they were wrong at the start anyway. Meanwhile, Shaggy breaks a few laws, so Fred has to check up front again. Scooby Dooby Doo! <laughs> And there you have it. That's the 13th Ghost movie. Does it invalidate the original series? No. But as a finale, is it entirely valuable? No, it can feel kind of pointless. Even the writer was excited because they never caught the 13 ghosts. And after this movie, because they had to tiptoe around it, it's arguable if they even have now, depending on how you feel about the ancestor thing. As a finale to the show, if that's what you go into it hoping for, it's not going to fulfill your dreams, most likely. And even if you go in with an open mind like me, you're still going to get upset about the continuity issues and missing or changed characters. But is it a bad movie? No, it's really just a bad sequel. Like I said before, if this was presented as a new adventure with the gang from that series, not promising to be the big finale people asked for, for years, I think people actually would have been a lot more open and receptive when it came to this film. I know there was excitement when Vincent came back in Mr. Incorporated unrelated to the show. The movie still has a fun enough plot, nice animation, solid voice performances, and a really fun dynamic with the gang that would be carried over in ways to the next film. Fred especially is fun to see. I wish we could get more Fred like this than we typically do. But obviously, it's understandable how it's not easy to separate it from the original series and the nostalgia audiences have for it. It's such a unique entry in the franchise already itself. I had to watch the movie multiple times to make this video, and it really wasn't an unpleasant nightmare. 
like some of them occasionally can be. But what about you? How do you feel about this particular film and how it fits into the Dew canon? I know there are still plenty who like it fine. Anyway, I think we've spent enough time trying to make sense of it, so let's head off to the middle of this trilogy. Okay, as much as 13 Ghosts gets flack from the general community, Return to Zombie Island definitely gets it worse due to the movie it's named for. As I said, this movie was a mandate from Warner to begin with as well, and Jeremy Adams, a childhood Scooby viewer, was hired to write after the fact, rather than being his idea or passion project, mainly having to follow Jim Krieg's ideas for the film. Krieg, again, hates supernatural and real monster elements in Scooby, so doing a sequel to a movie where the big twist was that it was real, once again, seems like the wrong choice. And Krieg basically had as much power over the film as Warner executives, much more over this one than 13th Ghost which is why we're focusing on it more here. Jeremy Adams, in that case, was the perfect person for him to hire, because they're known for being best friends. Adams' first writing job being Green Lantern, the animated series, itself a title co-created by Krieg. Nearly every title Adams has worked on has been for or with him, from the LEGO DC titles he did, tons of other DC animation work, Scooby Natural, or his Mortal Kombat DTV work. Scooby Natural, in particular, released a year before this, is another title that shows that balance of real and not real, with them writing the gang as mortified and unable to handle it when the supernatural actually happened, as if things truly are better when the monsters aren't real and should stay that way. And like I said, the continuity of these movies was focused more on being a sequel to Where Are You, which is basically what Warner wanted to focus on during this era of movies, not real monsters, something Warner was very strict about believing to be best for the property. Though it seems writers of both movies seem to feel it's not set in stone forever. That's why we got things like Guess Who, really focusing the property back on that old formula. Another notable thing was that they had him intentionally write this movie to be much safer for kids and lighter in tone, because the higher-ups didn't want a repeat of it being too scary like the original Zombie Island. You know, like kids love that movie usually. With Adams having written for so many Lego things, from DC to Scooby, stuff aimed at that very safe kind of audience, it again makes sense. All in all, if you want to know why Return to Zombie Island is not anything like the original, especially if you hate the movie for it, it's because both Warner execs and their mandates, and Jim Krieg, who hates the supernatural Scooby stories, wanted it to be this way and made exactly the movie they wanted to make. You can be upset with them, but that's their opinion on Scooby, and they're the ones getting to make it. And Krieg's love and passion for Scooby can't be understated, even if his opinion about not liking the series to be dark might be something you disagree with which I do. He loves Scooby. He just believes it's best when it lets kids face fears knowing it's just a man in a mask and still safe. You can tell he means well. I can still be confused about everything though. As I mentioned, the gang here are 17 going on 18 like in the prior movie, but famously we're adults in Zombie Island, but we're retconning it a bit while trying to fit into that same continuity. It's just a little too complicated, as much as they really try to make it work. The movie also of course makes sure to sidestep anything related to the antebellum mansion iconography or Civil War zombies beyond being in some shots, or anything else I reference in my Americana video. And that's no surprise, as writer Jeremy Adams mentioned a Dukes of Hazard crossover movie was in the works until Warner realized they didn't want to be showing off Confederate flag imagery right now, or ever again. So, you know, that was cancelled. Adams would ultimately say Return was one of the most difficult things he's worked on in his career with how many changes and notes happened, while also having to try and not invalidate the supernatural events of the original movie carefully. He ultimately felt like the movie didn't work for him, much like fans, and looks back at it as a really intense time. And it makes sense with basically having no control over what you're writing. Like I said though, he was enthusiastic about the idea of revisiting an old location and a mockumentary kind of thing, and I too think it's a neat idea. There was just a lot of play. Too many cooks were in this particular kitchen. Having gone over that, let's break down some of this movie as well, because I do still think Adams was able to write a fun movie divorced from the icon it's inspired by, albeit loosely. The movie kicks off with us right in the bayou of the original movie, the visuals of the credits actually showing us the events as a sort of recap, just like in 13th Ghost. Like there, a lot of these visuals are actually really nice. It's a pleasant credit sequence that drops us right back into the OG before we have to settle into the new stuff, and the end foreshadows the necklace that's used later. The actual movie kicks off with Red shining off the mystery machine as the gang fiendishly capture countless monsters like the good old days, including lots of classic references such as the Snow Ghost, Creeper, and Space Coop. But then it ends up falling back into oblivion as Fred wakes up from the dream. Daphne has to remind him that he had to sell it back in the first movie. Thelma shows off that she isn't doing too well either with the amount of unsolved mysteries she has archived on her blog. You have a blog? Yes, which you know because you've all subscribed, right? They recall the sheriff telling them they had to stop, but are still taunted by hearing mysteries everywhere. The ancient ghost materializes and asks passersby how to program the VCR. <laughs> What's a VCR? I don't know. Shaggy is fed up though, reinforcing what the sheriff said, forcing the gang to swear to give them a proper vacation this time. The sheriff is thrilled to see this, hoping they have the chance to just be kids while they still can and tells them to get out of the city and finally relax really. The boys turn on their favorite show hosted by queer icon herself Elvira, who becomes a recurring part of the trilogy from here. And I love that because it just feels right. I loved watching some classic Elvira last Halloween while editing the Scoob Dober videos. It was so pleasant, or I guess, unpleasant. Hello, darling. I'm just dangling some balls that I pulled out of this box. Gosh, I love gaying up a pine tree. 
Seriously, there's nothing like shoving a tree up an angel's ass and decking it out like a disco. <sighs> she also voiced Drilla Diabolic in the Lego movie Lego Scooby-Doo Haunted Hollywood. It turns out an anonymous sponsor is having her send her biggest fan to a tropical paradise. And of course, the winner is Shaggy and is allowed three guests and one pet. As sus as it is, the gang promised and don't question the convenience, and they head off on a familiar ferry. The gang can't help but notice things like the trees not matching a tropical paradise, but force themselves to keep the promise, and the captain says it's his last trip due to zombies, after which Daphne makes sure not to remember the last island with zombies, of which Velma is careful not to remember has an unsolved page on her blog, decreed by what they believe to be native islanders who tell them to get out, but putting on their best smiles, they assume it's a weird greeting. Velma is warned of zombies and has to fight really hard, but does manage to pack it away. Riding in a plane van kills Fred while missing his own, and the rest realize how awkward and quiet it is without a monster to discuss. A shadowy cat creature slashes a tree, and they find it's made of plastic up close. Plus, there's a slash on one of the van's tires, but as they're watched by the creature, they stay optimistic and hike the rest of the way. They notice the place is called Moonstar Island, which happens to look identical to Moonscar Island where they were before, covered in cats just like that one, where we get into flashbacks. We try and retcon here that Daphne was working at the TV station for a school project, but that really doesn't make sense. They clearly give off working their full-time adult jobs in the original, I do not buy it. It's kind of cool, I guess, to see iconic moments and characters recreate in this current style, catching up everyone on what we need to know and showing that necklace is left behind again. Felma gets really excited to possibly finally solve the case, but Shaggy isn't having it. They're introduced to the manager of the hotel, Alan, who seems to be wearing the necklace, and they notice the guest book is missing pages, which sidebar makes no sense as there was no guest book in the original mansion despite this movie suggesting this is from that, and they see a ton of security cameras everywhere. They then meet the rest of the staff, who seem conveniently dressed exactly like the cast of Zombie Island with near identical names, driving Velma Kuki as she bangs her head on the wall. One of them makes a strong first impression by randomly doing some Shakespeare, while another seems to start every sentence by saying yes and, weirdly. Daphne mentions hearing about the zombies and some of the staff run off in terror. Alan saying it's the island's greatest mystery, but the gang forced themselves to ignore it. Uh, she got two? No Great Dane! <laughs> The boys wait for a relaxing massage, but unfortunately a couple of rotting zombies plot toward them instead, which Shaggy finally realizes by breaking off a hand. Meanwhile, Fred is taunted by what sounds like the mystery machine, but the boys crash in to explain the zombies. The gang do their best to say maybe they were just guests with mud masks, but the boys hide in a very familiar looking kitchen anyway, accidentally falling down a chute into a cave where they see the cat god statue and realize where they really are before being chased by a zombie. The girls finally can't hold it in and discuss just how many weird things have happened, but decide they need to stop for Shaggy and Scooby, while Fred thinks he sees the van and fantasizes. The boys make it back and warn everyone, and outside, see the zombies approach. Do those look like mud masks? Kind of. Alan is distressed, does a retake with a better reaction, and faints. But to his confusion, the others still show no interest. The gang try to explain the only way they could do something is if the boys let them out of their promise, begging at this point but showing they care enough to only do something if they say it's okay. So the boys give the go-ahead to start looking at the mystery. They set a trap, let the zombies in, and catch them. But a cat creature sets some curtains on fire. As water pours down to stop the fire, the zombie makeup is washed away, and they unmask all the workers of the hotel. They explain the trees are fake, the woman said yes and as an acting improv technique among other stage cues, that Shakespeare is a common audition monologue, everyone was suspiciously attractive, there's cameras everywhere, and also the guest book, which again was not in the original despite suggesting it was, Thelma revealing that this was just to cover up that they're really at, as her blog called it, Zombie Island. Adding it all up, they're in a movie and Alan, the director, calls cut in frustration. Alan Smithy? Sure! It should be obvious, but Alan Smithy is the fake name put on movies when the actual director no longer wants their name associated with the final product. So that's that pun. He explains studios only care about franchises, like found footage movies, which is ironic since this movie was a nostalgia-based studio mandate franchise thing itself. And Alan found Velma's blog. We have a blog? Yeah. We see the unsolved section has Reluctant Werewolf, as I mentioned in the previous video, but also Zombie Island, which he thought would be perfect. Daphne is like, but that was solved, which, yeah, but Velma being skeptical can't let it go. And Alan mentions not using cat creatures because just zombies is cheaper. Alan simply called up Elvira as a way to get the gang here and had to try and keep them from being suspicious, although the tree and tires were not his doing. Ultimately, the gang was just too good and ruined his plans despite hoping the necklace he found would be good luck, which Velma finally recognizes as Simone's. Your good looks. Well, I suppose so. The gang proposed that they can still make the movie anyway, especially since they came to have fun, Velma hoping to also solve the original mystery. The scenes of them making the movie are pretty fun, honestly. If I'm just here for modern versions of the gang doing goofy stuff, this does the job as well as any movie. A stunt mystery machine pulls out and Fred literally starts panting from excitement, then meets his stunt double who says he can't drive it for safety. Scooby, meanwhile, can't get his line right and only repeats that he's hungry, which is a really cute scene, sorry if I'm lame and like it. 50 minutes into this movie, I've accepted that this is just a silly fun romp in a classic setting and not otherwise truly related. I'm Alan Smithy. Have you seen how many movies I've done? 
No. I also love the scene of the gang not being able to fake looking scared. They are cute, okay? The cat creature cuts the chandelier, which almost falls on Alan, though, barely saved by Scooby. And finding the cat hair makes Velma hysterical while hoping to solve the case. She gets herself fully prepped up and ready to be on her A game, flying down the stairs full of joy and showing her obsession over solving Zombie Island in her confrontation with Daphne, making sense given her need to solve 13 ghosts just before. No matter how much Daphne points out that they were there, she can't be convinced. She's too manic. Scooby then ends up being terrified of a cat lured out by her, which really doesn't make sense given his aggression toward them during Zombie Island being such a big deal. They do end up attacking everyone, leading most of the cast and crew to quit, and actual cat people come out of the shadows. Before they can get on the ferry, Alan sets it on fire, which according to writer Jeremy Adams was originally Velma's action, but the studio was like, no, you cannot have her do that, and made him change it. I really wish it had been her though, it would make so much sense. Fred jumps on to save the stunt mystery machine though, making the leap across and getting everyone safe inside except for Alan as the cats seem to really want that necklace. I do love the found footage type of thing they try to keep going on with making the movie, sorry if you don't. The creature from before tears open the van, and they nearly avoid all the traps in their way as stunt Fred points out they have to make the big jump for the movie to escape, and it's up to real Fred to do it. They miraculously make it, even catching it with a drone for the movie, and we get probably the most out of place thing if you want the tone of Zombie Island. For the big chase, they play a new song for the movie meant to sound just like all the ones during the chase scenes of the original Where Are You series, and I think the song really does capture the feel of them quite well. Even if it does also feel like it's just trying to be like them and not like it really is one of them authentically, if that makes sense. Regardless, I do think this scene is fun and well executed for this type of thing, especially after enduring 52 episodes of Guess Who doing one every episode and just falling flat. So I really appreciate a chase scene that isn't so bland. Obviously though, if you want zombie island tone, you're gonna hate it. It is what it is. Needing to hide, the boys have everyone use the shoot they found before to get to the cave, and Velma continues to rationalize how this will finally make sense of the original case. There are holes everywhere suggesting the creatures are looking for the treasure, and looking around, Velma believes she's solved this mystery. The creatures show up and find the necklace among torn up clothes, and place the pendant on the dial which leads them to their treasure. It also brings out the gang now turned into zombies, and I guess some of these shots are pretty cool. The creatures beg them to stop and confess, unmasked to reveal the two supposed island natives and fairy captain. The gang of course just used the movie magic as Vilma explains they're the only ones not part of the movie around, and knew they must believe the legend including zombies if they believe in the treasure. The gold as well was just a plant by the gang for them. A cat whistle controlled the cats, and the three reveal the fourth cat that was attacking isn't anyone they know. Alan supposing maybe there's a real one left out there, as a great true story angle for the movie. And also a bone for us as the audience. Meanwhile, the cats who were supposed guardians of the treasure seem to actually dig it up. With all that gold, you can make a sequel. Or maybe a trilogy. Well, a trilogy. <laughs> Alan, however, declares happy retirement, and Velma is thrilled to finally say she solved Zombie Island. She says the cat people last time were the same ones as this time, the zombies were just swamp gas hallucinations, and Daphne decides to let her have this one. Basically, just like 13th Ghost, Velma very much did not solve the case in reality. She just needs to believe she did for her own sanity and ego. Her explanation clearly doesn't line up with the original film, and there's nothing to say that this actually invalidates the events of the original movie happening. Daphne and Fred's reaction, if anything, just makes it obvious that's what's happening. It it's still a little confusing though, so it's understandable that a lot of people will come out of the movie feeling like it tried to say Zombie Island never really happened. At the end of the day, the studio and producer never were going to let real creatures happen again, and this is the best we get. Anyway, Velma decides they officially can't listen to the sheriff or anyone else who wants them to stop solving mysteries because it's their destiny, and decide to make it official. Fred regretting selling the van, though Daphne insists they'll do whatever they can to get it back. Not so happy is the sheriff, disappointed to see them regress. The gang start giving him their sobbing pleas though, and he weakens enough to let them go ahead, letting them off with a warning to be careful. <laughs> Something really fun with the credits happens though, as Elvira introduces us to a trailer for the movie they made, complete with new footage full of bloopers, which really is such a fun treat, from Velma advertising her blog to Shaggy losing his robe. I miss when we used to get this often. Even Scooby movies like Loch Ness Monster used to do it. That's a wrap though. With that, we've reached the end of Return to Zombie Island. Again, if you want a sequel to Zombie Island, gosh, it's as infuriating as 13th Ghost. You've got the guest book thing. You've got Velma insisting that the original didn't happen, which is so convincing that a lot of viewers think the movie believes that, despite even showing a possibly real cat creature. There's the fact that 13 Ghost said that case was their first real ghost encounter when Zombie Island should have been. The fact that the gang were undeniably adults in that movie and saying it was school project stuff or whatever that just does not sound believable. It's a mess. I could go on and others already have. Even so, I still think the idea of revisiting older cases or trying to solve 
solve what can't be solved is actually a fun and interesting concept. Maybe they just didn't really execute it the best. And maybe that's because of studio meddling with how much was consistently rewritten with notes. But while far from perfect, I think a lot of people just don't get it, kind of? I don't mean that in a pretentious way as much as I've been called that. The promise and assumption of getting the same tone as the original, which to be fair should be expected that is very much the fault of the movie, clouds any judgment by default. I love the original Zombie Island, but I went into this fresh and ready to see it for its own thing. And it's fun if you divorce it from those expectations. I really do think people are too harsh on it. Not maliciously, of course. And everyone is entitled to opinions. Including saying this is one of, if not the worst, of the Scooby movies. Obviously, I get the frustration and have expressed it in the past about them. It's just, like 13th Ghost, it's not necessarily a bad movie. Just a bad sequel. And maybe why we should not be doing sequels to these if we can't actually make them sequels. People keep asking why the original trilogy doesn't get one. And well, take a look and say you still would want one, at least from this most recent era. It's clearly one that could never do justice to any of that trilogy, even if I do like these movies more after making this video. I don't plan on changing your mind on it, though. Obviously, a majority of people have the strong belief that this movie especially is irredeemable. That's fine. I won't stop you. I get it. I'll just have some goofy fun with it on my own sometimes. The lesson at the end of the day, yet again, is studio meddling is bad, and a truly good movie can probably never come out of it most times. The nightmares behind this one sound more terrifying than any monster. What do you think of it though, even if I can take a guess? Regardless, the mess continues with the, well, sort of final film of the trilogy, so let's transfer over there to see what happened next. And now we come to the big finale movie, which apparently was not going to be this movie originally. I'm going based off the stories of the writers of Return and Happy Halloween individually here to put the pieces together and understand the narrative to present a more digestible explanation. It's not really clear, but a lot of things ended up happening behind the scenes, moving and changing things around, where the third movie was really building toward capitalizing on all the things set up, like with Velma and her crisis about not being able to solve these real supernatural elements. Clearly, big development was being set up for her with both these movies, but something went wrong and it got scrapped, losing the payoff as it was intended. Maxwell Adams, the creator of The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, and who would also co-write with Jeremy Adams and direct The Sword and the Scoob after this, wrote, produced, and directed this film. However, it was the end of writing the script just a week before finishing that basically Warner came to him and said, this was now suddenly going to be the end of this trilogy he otherwise had nothing to do with instead. And so he had to rewrite parts of the movie to integrate continuity things like the sheriff that had been planned for whatever the original third movie was going to be, but ultimately not having a full payoff because it's still not the finale to the trilogy that was actually planned. The other elements were just kind of stuffed into it. You'll notice they have the mystery machine back in this movie when they had lost it in the first two. And that's because Adams had already written it to be integral to this story and it was too late to change it and show how they got it back. He wasn't even necessarily told why the villain was the bad guy at the end, just that that's the character meant to be the final reveal for the original end of the trilogy, and he had to work with it. The movie was meant for 2019 like the other two to coincide with the 50th anniversary of Scooby, but didn't make it to release until late 2020, which makes me wonder if the delay from how Adams talks had something to do with this problem. The lesson yet again is that the Warner executives had their hands all over over this one until it sort of became a huge mess. That's the story of this entire trilogy, really. This one probably came out the safest and most solid because of it not actually being part of that trilogy to begin with, but obviously the meddling still had an impact on the final product. Let's break down some of it to see what came together. This one opens up with the return of Elvira herself after she popped up before, now leading afloat in Crystal Cove for Halloween. Also, why does this movie take place in Crystal Cove? That was kind of a Mystery Incorporated exclusive location for very intentional reasons, while Coolsville was the legacy setting. But some movies like this or other shows since sometimes still use this locale. Trick or Treat most recently returned to Coolsville because it made sense. I don't think Crystal Cove makes sense here despite the talk of the caves, but anyway. The gang is covertly getting ready to trap a bad guy with a new app, meanwhile. And Daphne noticeably has lost her darker skin tone from the first two movies for a much lighter pale look, again suggesting a lack of production continuity. Not to mention they just have the van back, as I said, without explaining how. These aren't problems with the movie. They're problems with the movie's part in unrelated trilogy, by the way. Are you serious? One note, I love Daphne's personality in this movie. Adam said he based her off her personality in Be Cool Scooby-Doo, where she's exceptional. Also right here, you can see Red Herring himself from a pup named Scooby-Doo. The bad guy, Scarecrow, aka the Batman villain, is here, and I love how Elvira gets safely in her coffin during this. I absolutely adore the credit sequence between the song, the single shot going through the cast, and how fun the feeling of it all is. I love that so many of the movies have fun with the credits. They unmask the Scarecrow as himself, Jonathan Crane, and no, I don't really know why we have a Batman villain without Batman. I was asked why I didn't include Scarecrow in my Batman video, and that's why. He's not in this. The sheriff, who design-wise himself looks a little different here, pulls up to take care of things, and Daphne pressures Scarecrow to say the thing. But he had a second part of his plan, though thankfully with help from the boys, they stopped that too. <laughs> Elvira gets the party started, but the sheriff has to announce it's a crime scene, and Scarecrow calls the gang young adults, suggesting they've at least made it to 18 now. This is what we do. Word. Nothing but net. 
Taking you down was easy. Basic. How about a little sick burn, Scarecrow? I wrote the app to counter the signal used to control your gas grenades myself. Womp womp. I love her, sorry. Scarecrow threatens Velma and sees a lot of that caped crusader who shan't be named in her, ominously foreshadowing things to come as a fair warning. Fred is delusional over the state of the van, then he references chasing the ghosts of the three Stooges last year, which is interesting since they met the canonically alive Stooges themselves in the new Scooby-Doo movies, and the boys head off to trick-or-treat. Later, they notice toxic waste from a wrecked truck leaking through fear gas from the drones from before and into a pumpkin patch, leading the pumpkins to come alive and chase them. <laughs> The sheriff reminds the rest of the gang of his warnings to stop and that whatever happens is their fault going forward. Even as Velma points out, they caught the bad guy. Kind of backwards from his acceptance at the end of the last movie, don't you think? A little girl and her dad thank them, though. Hey, nerds. Oh, you all turned around? Wow. Elvira reveals reporters want to interview the gang, just in time for the boys to get back ranting and raving. Velma gets tired of it and just blows up at them, which I don't love and makes me sad. I am sad for them. I love the scene with Daphne cleaning them up. You can really see the Be Cool influence here. When it's time to wash an owl, and you wish that you had a towel, but you don't have a towel, so you got to use your sweater. Bang, 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 ding, 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 ding. Also, Snow White vibes with the owl. <laughs> We fought some dumb monsters, guys, but that's just dumb. Thelma, meanwhile, says they've been doing this since they got a pup named Scooby-Doo, when they randomly get a call from Bill Nye the Science Guy, who they also met during Guess Who. Once again, I don't know why Bill Nye is here. It does not make sense, especially for Halloween, the way Elvira does, but sure. Anyway, he's here to drop off a gift he calls the Mystery Machine X, to Thelma's delight and Fred's disinterest since it's not the same as his baby. Basically, Bill wants to solve mysteries with them. Don't know why. Don't know why he's here. Whatever. They hear a scream of one of the reporters who was taken by a pumpkin, apparently. And Daphne meets up with Elvira, forming a bond similar to the one she formed with Elvira's character stand in in Lego Scooby Doo Haunted Hollywood. I don't want to be you, silly. Just to look and think like you, but still have free will. Elvira decides to take Daphne in, mainly to have someone to pack away her luggage, while more jack o' lanterns activate everywhere. Fred and Velma find what the boys were talking about while searching for the reporter, but she gets eaten by the biggest jack and turned into one herself, all chasing the duo as Velma can't bring herself to believe this. Elvira safely gets in the car as Daphne fights. Wow! You're a regular Mary Sue! And they try to speed away as they see more familiar faces have become pumpkins. They safely pass the others, and Fred begs the family from before to take the boys as everything crumbles, all three vehicles racing off. While Velma freaks out because this isn't possible... <gasps> She's still back there! My love! Oh, Daphne made it out with Elvira. No, no, the mystery machine. Bill agrees the fault lines don't make sense with the town crumbling like this, so this shouldn't be possible. Yet despite that, the pumpkins join the race in the Halloween floats. Elvira hands Daphne her blowtorch to disconnect their own float and get away faster while Fred tries to help. Frederick Herman Jones, do not torch explain to me when I am carrying a torch for you. I mean... A lot of the rest of the movie low-key becomes a wacky racist type of movie just like the majority of this area of Reluctant Werewolf as an end to that other trilogy in the previous video, which is an interesting coincidence. Unfortunately, also where I lose a lot of interest in this one like that movie as well. Also, how is everyone effortlessly communicating from different cars by now? Are we on a group call or something? Thelma wonders if fear gas is to blame, which was my first thought, but Bill already tested the air and it's clear. Thelma tries to make sense of this in her mind palace, as she calls it, and it seems to start breaking her once again due to her being unable to believe real monsters could exist. Bill does point out mutations don't normally happen like this. And Shaggy finally gives Velma an idea. Shaggy, I could kiss you! Oh! <laughs> Whoa! Why'd that escalate fast? Not like that. She recalls what Scarecrow said before, and they catch up to the sheriff to talk to the villain himself, but he's not aware of what's happening and has no control over the situation, freaking out and trying to tell the gang to get out and be safe. As much as I grumble at you kids, I feel almost like you're the only family I've got. But we've only talked like eight or ten times. Unfortunately, it seems his death flag has been triggered and he falls back to the pumpkins. Messing with the van, Velma accidentally ejects herself and Fred takes over, getting really pissed off seeing the pumpkins took over the real mystery machine while the boys eject themselves over to Velma, and they knock on the truck with Scarecrow. Velma tries to get info out of him, seeming to be right that this was never about Elvira, and he himself deduces that there must be someone else leading he and the gang together, pulling the strings. Daphne loves Elvira's corset a little too much and asks to switch outfits fully, just like when they met in the Lego world, with the excuse of acting as bait. Fred, meanwhile, saves the family and gets them in the van but it seems to lose power at the worst time. Elvira and Daphne save the boys, and Velma has to choose to let Scarecrow go or save herself, fighting off pumpkins to free him from his prison. She then saves everyone in the van, but it seems Scarecrow has disappeared on her as expected, until he cuts them loose from the pumpkins and they safely make their way to Daphne. Scarecrow then defeats the pumpkins and gets control of the van, while the OG van sadly bursts into flames. Velma's relief is short-lived, however, as Scarecrow is taken and she sits back with her sadness. Worse, they're out of gas and they have to start running by foot as Velma accepts the sheriff was right about them being in over their heads. It seems 
everything has gone wrong and all is lost. But Fred still has an idea. Also, this shot of him ripping his costume off. Um, this is very interesting. I'm very interested. No, really, I'm Daphne here enjoying the show. After how she acted earlier, Velma finally appreciates what the boys bring to the table and how much they really matter. And to help her in her mind palace, they feed her a Scooby snack to symbolically be there. Joining her, they drive through her memories but can't seem to find too much that's useful between the pumpkins and drones. Velma trusts science will prevail as the pumpkin gets closer, but she trusts her friends even more, ready for battle. Fred's traps take countless pumpkins out easily, and the gang are ready to fight whatever makes it past that as the big bad eventually comes up. Velma admits she's afraid to the pumpkin leader, a failing science and justice, failing her friends, but she isn't afraid of it, jumping inside. Her voice calls out telling Fred to use the trapping app, which deactivates all the pumpkins, revealing a robot and all of the smaller pumpkins to be drones, which she realized thanks to the boys earlier. Meanwhile, everyone who was taken was put inside the big pumpkin and given a pumpkin clone. Scarecrow, however, didn't do this. Velma remembered the mines with lithium that someone must have wanted to start mining, revealing the true mastermind. Or she would if he was there. Instead, he reveals himself the sheriff that's been trying to stop them since the first movie. Turns out he was the culprit of this one case from years ago, the maker of the drones himself, and has been behind everything for years, trying to get revenge against them for making his company lose stock value and losing its lithium mine. He decided to involve the Scarecrow, move to Crystal Cove, and play the long game impersonating a sheriff, playing with the gang's emotions this whole time while he secretly was preparing the mines, and eventually hoping to humiliate the gang. Unfortunately for them, the real deal is already speeding off safely, until Velma reveals he's talked long enough to track his location. As the connection is lost, and ominous scarecrow shadow then looms upon him. When the authorities find the car, there's nobody there. The gang and friends finally make the long walk back to town, the family safely heading home in a cab while the others happen upon a Halloween party. Can I have the wig? It's not a wig. Were you just trying to replace Elvira and take over her life? She's done this before. We went and solved three mysteries with Phyllis Diller before we even figured it out. I'm proud to be your mentor of the dark. It's not a wig. It's a macaque. And her name is Meredith. <laughs> Go ahead, put her on. You burned her. That is certainly interesting. Elvira says goodbye and heads off, walking back to address us in the audience like on her show, revealing one last frightful twist. Happy Halloween. The credits then show Fred helping Bill design a mystery machine that actually fits his style, working hard to afford it while the boys dig around for parts before also joining in the labor. Then the eventual build and the final moment of bringing her back to life at last. Scooby Dooby Doo! And that's Happy Halloween, Scooby-Doo. Once again, not a bad movie, just a bad sequel. But in this case, a bad sequel to the previous two films and not a pre-existing classic. As its own movie, it's really fun and I love it, which makes sense considering it was originally meant to be a standalone anyway. Daphne is so fun in this movie. I love Elvira and their interactions and they're probably my favorite part. I love creepy scarecrows, including this one, so the DC villain is fun to play with, even if it's weird to use him without Batman. Plus the animation and music between the songs and score are fun. I don't understand why Bill Nye is here or relevant to Halloween though. Pamela Anderson was one of the two people originally considered but dropped, and I don't see how she's related to Halloween either. I really wonder what the climax would have been like if it didn't have to be changed to make the sheriff the culprit, which obviously would not have been the case at all before this became the trilogy finale. Considering that, I'm not holding it against this one for not being the best sequel. Thelma has some sort of conclusion, I guess, to her arc in the first two, but it's clearly not as strong as it probably would have been if it was whatever they planned initially from the sounds of it, which makes me sad because it actually could have been such an interesting thing to do with her character. As a trilogy, this mess just isn't really cohesive, and I can't think of a single reason why these movies need to be related whatsoever outside being Scooby movies in a general continuity. It's just weird and kind of disappointing. That's what this trilogy is as a whole. Disappointing. Two supposed sequels that don't want to be sequels due to so much studio meddling and producer desires that don't line up with the material, and a final movie that doesn't want to be a sequel to the last two movies because it wasn't meant to be. But despite that, I also think there's a lot to really enjoy and have fun with when it comes to this trilogy as well. You just have to go in with an open mind and not have the biggest expectations possible. After all, they exist, so we might as well see and accept them for whatever the hell they did come out as. Even if that means still hating them for some of us, which is understandable. What did you think of Happy Halloween in particular, especially since it doesn't have that nostalgic tie that could backfire like the first two and is mostly innocent here? For me, it's one of my recent favorites, even if not at the top. I think we focused on it enough for now, so let's get things moving before Dawn approaches. What a strange little trilogy, even more than the 80s one. It really makes you think about what goes on behind the scenes of these movies when we normally might not put as much thought into it when it comes to a direct-to-video Scooby-Doo film. What stories are there about all those others, you might wonder? I know the OG Zombie Island era had some nightmares with studio meddling, which is why that team stopped making movies after Cyber Chase. I really wonder what they were thinking when putting this trilogy together. Even just having them all be written by different people that aren't really communicating seems like they were asking for nothing to be cohesive. And it shows when Velma's real versus fake arc and the sheriff are about the only real ties on the surface. After giving them a more fair 
fair shake for this video, I don't hate these movies, but I understand why some will always consider them majorly weak links in the DTV canon. Even the writer of Return isn't too in love with the final product of that one. I do think they're a little misunderstood and hold some value if you give them a bit of leeway though. I wanted to have 80 minutes of goofy Scooby fun and I got it, so they served a basic purpose, and I don't think they're incompetent, especially given how much they went through, which makes it a miracle they're coherent at all. What's your personal experience with this trilogy though? Do you like any of these individually? Do you like them as a whole? What are your problems or things you appreciate regarding them? Did you even know these were a trilogy, considering they aren't advertised as such? I know some people probably wanted me to tear these a new one, especially Return, but I hope I at least was able to join you in some of the criticisms while having my fun. I don't like being negative in videos. I want to talk about things that are fun, even if it's fun bad. And in my next video if things go as planned, I think I'll be getting into something that's just fun good. Something a lot of people have asked for on the channel for a long time, in fact. And no, it's not the OG Zombie Island. I don't think I'll ever cover that four movie era because I have nothing new or interesting to say about it. I love those movies. I think all four are great. I watch them all the time, you know? Everyone on YouTube has said it all before me. Sorry, I would have no reason or passion. If you want some really excellent Zombie Island content, go check out 47 Cartoon Guy on YouTube if you haven't. He recently put out a video on the impact of that movie in addition to many other great pieces about it and Scooby and Hanna-Barbera and more. As for me, I think that's all I wanted to say for this video. For interview sources, check the description where you can find an interview with Tim Sheridan via a podcast named Scooby-Doo, interviews with Jeremy Adams or Jim Creed via JB and Millie, as well as an interview with Maxwell Adams from New York Comic Con. If you like this video, which I hope you did because it took a while to make and I'm losing my voice, can you tell I'm losing my voice? Oh my God. Uh, hit the like button, subscribe for whatever comes next, follow me on socials if you want to, and I guess that's it, and I'm really thankful because I can't talk much longer. See you next time in Scooby-Topia. Bye! <laughs>